Hello! Welcome to my record cave. iCreates asked me to make a video about the music industry. Now, obviously that's a pretty wide topic and... Uh, I was at a birthday party or a birthday dinner just last weekend and um, we were kind of just hanging out and at one point I uh, started telling a story, I don't remember why, but I started talking about the Brill Building and as I was telling the story I realized it'd probably be pretty interesting uh, to do for this thing here, so um, hey man, let's hear about the Brill Building, alright? It's always pretty interesting um, to hear people complain about pop music today, um, you know, and uh, how manufactured it is and so forth. And um, although I'm not a big fan of most of what's on radio, I still don't think that pop music in and of itself is a bad thing. I think there's some great pop music. So uh, then I started thinking about it and it's really funny how everybody kind of digs the Motown sound and the 60s girl groups, including myself. and. I kind of brought it back and thought to myself, well, you know what, you couldn't get more processed than that. Back in the 50s and 60s, people were buying singles more than albums, all right, so the, the onus was really on trying to sell a million singles. So uh, there was this building uh, downtown on Man Manhattan Street, I believe, called the Braille Building. This was like a building of 12 floors and the entire building was occupied by people from the music industry. And there was a building just adjacent, I think a block down or something, that's another building where, where, again, the entire building was occupied by people in the music industry. What they'd do is all of them were kind of specialized in their way, right? So there'd be a lot of the music publishers, a lot of people, you know, would release singles and have their salespeople then pitch it to the radio stations and try to get airplay in their particular region. So if you hear a lot about, let's say, 60 songs or 50 songs, you know, they'll talk about number one in one particular region, whereas that doesn't exist anymore. It's kind of like number one almost doesn't mean anything anymore in the age of, uh, you know, the internet. Did I just sound crotchety? Yeah, that sounded crotchety. I'm getting crotchety. I'm getting to be one of those guys that kind of says, I remember when. And um, I always said that when I would reach that point, somebody should, like, take me to the back of the barn and, uh, you know. Okay, so back to the Brill Building. All of the floors would be occupied uh, by people in the music industry. So you'd have a lot of uh, record publishers, for example, who'd be there. And what they'd do is they'd just set up an office with maybe a piano in the corner. And songwriters would literally come into the door and do their sales pitches. You know, so it's like you'd get a trio or something, or you'd get uh, some songwriters, you know, and they'd make their pitch office to office. And what they'd do is they'd start up on the 12th floor and work their way down because it was easier for them to walk down than it was that it would be to walk up, right? So that's what they do. So obviously you'd think, you know, the highest floors occupied the highest rent. Why? Because those are the guys that got the cream of the crop, right? Everybody came out of the elevator and the first door right out of the elevator is the door that got the most traffic. Back in the 50s and 60s, singers per se or groups per se didn't really write their own music. Writing was done by a writing team or by a writer and uh, the music was performed by uh, the artists. So um, yeah, uh, literal who's who in the 50s and 60s passed through those doors including uh, yeah, we got Neil Diamond. Um, I always said I wouldn't do show and tell and here I am doing show and tell. Burt Bacharach, very important, very good stuff. Uh, one of the big names, actually, uh, in Braille building history, uh, Carol King. She wrote a bunch of great tunes. There were million sellers. Um, oh, yeah, and uh, yeah, a lot of his songs got uh, produced there as well. So, uh, yeah, man, Elvis was a product, you know. Just like the Backstreet Boys or uh, whatever is hip these days and sucks. So what would wind up happening, because it was basically a one-stop shop for music in New York, uh, it'd almost be like a factory, just a music factory. And the whole idea was to pump out as many million sellers as possible. And uh, that's exactly uh, what Carol King describes, actually, in a video that I had seen one point where she says, it's like, well, look, you know, we were just brought in there and 
our job was to churn out hits, you know, they were kind of like writers of music, so seen as employees. Of course, they kept their publishing, so a lot of these guys all of a sudden, you know, like Lieber and Stoller, Carol King and her husband, I forgot his name, uh, you know, wind up with these big checks of like several million dollars. So, you know, that's pretty cool. The thing is, is there was also something else that happened a lot in the music industry back then, uh, especially to black artists, and that is, is that they never got to keep their publishing. Phil Spector was actually notorious for doing that. He'd always give himself a producer's credit so that he'd get the penny off, you know, every record that was sold. So, uh, yeah, a lot of that stuff uh, happened, and I'm pretty sure it still happens today. Uh, well, no, actually, the music industry doesn't exist anymore, so it doesn't happen anymore. So, in effect, a lot of music really came out of two buildings. Just like, you know, you'd think of uh, a clothing factory or something like that. Well, music was that factory right there okay of course Barry Gordy at that point decides that he's gonna set up shop in Detroit now Elvis is good that's that's not that's not what I meant 